You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Guys, he doesn't need an introduction. I'm just going to call him the Catfish King or the Rap God. I think, I don't know, that you might actually have to sue somebody over that one. I think he might have that done. Um, you guys have been asking for him for a while. I finally got a hold of him. He's really done a great job down in the Rappahannock area of Virginia. He runs two fantastic fishing reports. And yeah, we're just going to be, we're going to continue what we were talking about here with, um, with really the inflatable boats and like where, how you got into all this. I mean, did you just one day decide like, I just want to be fishing full time or what got you into all this? Yeah. So, um, I was in the service. I was in the army for a little bit, got out, had problems drinking, partying, the usual thing when you get out and you're lost and you don't know what you're doing as a 20 something young, 20 something year old. Did all that, got into some trouble, straightened my life up. Um, 2010, started trying to figure out exactly what my next step was in life. Um, was doing a whole bunch of different stuff, just wasn't really happy until my old lady took me out. She's like, you know what, hey, let's just go out and go fishing one time. Now, and I've been fishing since I was four years old, five years old. Grew up at Monroe Bay Campground in Colonial Beach, riding a bike with one rod and a five-gallon bucket six, seven years old, riding around, casting, catching turtles, having fun, catching snakes my whole life, all that stuff. So I knew I liked the outdoors. Military, I knew I liked the outdoors. Partying kind of pulled me away from that towards the city life where I never really felt like I fit in. It was too just too much chaos. Then once I started fishing, I was like, I was like, this is, you know, I can really get into this. I can focus on this. I can, it can help me quiet some of the stuff from the military that I'm trying to quiet as a use it as a focus thing to, to help get rid of, rid of some PTSD and some other things. Um, and then once I started just doing it more and more and more, the passion just started kicking in like full force. And it just, it just ignited a whole bunch of stuff. And the next thing you know, spending money on gear, fishing 12 hours a day, nonstop every day. I started out fishing. When I did this, I wanted to start from zero. I wanted to go from bank fishing, shore fishing, pier fishing, learn all that so I could learn the solar and lunar so I could figure out how to use the tides, the water flow to my advantage to figure out how the weather conditions affect the water. I did that for three years. I built an electric trike, okay? A Schwinn trike. I put four rod holders on the back. That's pretty so cool. I could go from my house to downtown Fredericksburg and fish and fish all the ponds. I got 35 ponds within 10 miles of my house, and I fished every single one of them. I snuck on a gun club to go fishing. So, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> a plumbing box truck ran me over in 2016 on that trike, coming back from the tackle shop, coming back to the house to get more gear to go back to the river. Um, <sighs> luckily, it didn't do too much serious damage, tore up a bunch of soft tissue on my left side. Um, in my left leg, the drive wheel is what really saved my leg um, from getting destroyed. I ended up underneath the box truck. But, oh my god, um, dude! Yeah, luckily, you know, a lot of people was like, "You could have died," and I didn't realize it's about a month and a half later. And I was like, "Oh crap! Yeah, you're right. I could have died." But anyway, so I got a settlement from that, and I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna buy a boat." And I was like, "I, I first wanted a kayak," and then I was like, "You know, let's get somebody else out with me." Just so that we have somebody, I like to have somebody else with me so that we can all, you know, it's better to go out with somebody. Sometimes it's nice to go out by yourself. Don't get me wrong, but it's also fun to go out with people. So I looked at this thing and I saw this boat, this boat that folds up it's like the size of a surfboard and they would use that as sailboat tenders. So the sailboat would park in a cove and then they would unfold the boat, put it together, put an, uh, an outboard on it, run in, get supplies, come back, fold it back up, put it back on top of the deck. And you wouldn't have to tow a dinghy. Hmm. So, and it's only 55 pounds, the one I have, and that's 12 foot long. So, then you put the seats in, and I think it's like 75 pounds. And it's got a fold out transom that interlocks, and you can put a motor on. Nine times out of 10, I run a trolling motor. It's really quiet, it doesn't have a rigid hull. So, you get zero hull smack. You that's slither through cool. the wall. Dude, you slither so well, and it's gray. So, it looks like a cloud. Huh. So, that's another reason why I think we catch a lot of fish out of it. It's quiet, it's stealthy. And it looks like a cloud. If you got glitter on your boat, I'm sorry, you're not going to be catching much. Not unless you're fishing deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but so I bought that and I've been fishing out of that. And I had to relearn the waterway once I got back on the water, how the, the water flowed, how much time it took 
um, on certain coefficients for the tide current to actually flip. Like say you hit high tide at noon, but the coefficient's 110, it's gonna be one o'clock before the current coming in stops, you know, so I had to relearn all that stuff. But once I figured that out and I started learning flow dynamics and where water movement goes and how it pushes bait into areas and all that stuff, I could really hone in on fishing. So I think fishing from the bank and the piers first gave me an advantage because it's like, okay, I, I'm patient. I can sit here and wait for the bite, but the fish have to come to me from a fixed position. Now mm -hmm. I can go to them. I can work it whatever way I want. Before I was cut bait and all that. Now I'm almost strictly artificial is not less we can get live bait. And that's, that's usually how I run it. Most of the times around, unless it gets really cold and we, and it's hard to get them to hit artificials and we just minnows or shad or bunker or whatever. But <clears throat> I really think starting out on the piers and the banks really gave me the advantage because you learn how to deal with water movement to your advantage first before you get on a boat. Then not only that, I got a small boat that doesn't allow me to run from spot to spot to spot to spot. And I feel like some people kind of get in that mode where they want to spot hop and just hit, you know, 10 casts and bounce around about burn a bunch of fuel, you know, and motor in and motor out and make a bunch of noise and all that other stuff. I like to just put, put the boat in, put the troll motor down, and we just go start working. My, nine wow. times out of ten, it's, it's with the current, and then we just make big loops and come right back to where we started from. We so, don't ever stop. We don't ever stop moving. We don't anchor unless we're, mm -hmm. you know, cut baiting for catfish or stripers or something like that. But if we're casting, we never stop moving. Now, and you said you have a center console now too. I had a center console that we were working on. Um, it was out in the bay. I had gotten a motor for it, put it together, and all that stuff, and it still crapped out. So I traded it for a kayak. Oh, That's cool. why I got a kayak. Yeah. I was like, man, I was like, I don't feel like dealing with it, man. The trailer was crap, and I was like, you know, it was a nice boat that a buddy gave me, thank God, but it just never got there to where I wanted it to, and I traded it for something else that I've been using way more often, which was a Johnny Johnny Boat Bass 100. I'm pretty shocked at how much kayaking has taken off. Like, it's gotten stupid, like, how big of a craze it is. And it's funny because people did it because it was cheap, but then now you get, like, $4,500 kayaks, and you might as well get a it's center insane. console. It's like it's ridiculous. Yeah, people are putting ten grand into one. It's just oh, nuts. dude, I got like, buddies. I got buddies that will drop ten grand on one like it ain't nothing. And with fish finders, pedal drives, torpedoes, battery packs, all that stuff, man, you're easily ten grand. That's a lot of money to be putting on a kayak, that, and and then you need a trailer for it because it's so heavy and huge. You ain't getting up oh, on top of a roof rack. Yeah, it's like the, uh, what is it, the Hobie, like 15 or whatever, 14 or whatever. That thing is like massive. It's a boat is what it is. Yeah, it's a small, it, it's a small one-man dugout. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. all it is. That's, yeah, that, that, that you need a trailer dugout. for. And a lot of people tell me that they crack on the surface and in the scupper plug holes. Really? Yeah. <sighs> I've, I've heard more people say cracks on Hobies than I have anywhere else. Now, that's just what I've been hearing. I've been showed three times where the cracks were in, inside the kayak and why they were there. One guy had the wheels that stick up in the scupper, and every time he would move it, it would torsion it, and it ripped the seam oh, apart. Okay. But then the other guy was just standing on it, and it cracked at the scupper edge. Hmm. I guess it was just a thin spot in the mold or something. I don't know. So do but, you fish any kind of like tournaments for kayaks? Is that is that anything? Is that your vibe? I did one this year. I hosted from from here, from this location that I'm at now in Port Royal, I did host a snakehead tournament in April, uh, end of April this year. Oh, cool. And we kept it hush-hush for three months so the bow guys didn't know about it. Thank God, because we caught 35-plus snakehead in the tournament with, like, 18 anglers or something like that. I think the biggest one was, like, 33 inches, something was like that. catch and release or catch and keep? Uh, this was – you could either you could do either or, but all you were either doing or. was sending pictures in of measurements. So we had oh, okay. a – I had a – um monitor on the water that everybody would text the pictures to and he was our in a, an aluminum boat running around if people needed help or anything like that and then i had someone at shore receiving the text from him to figure out what placement they were and all that stuff while we were all out on the water and it worked out it worked out really well everybody had a blast i mean it's like a thousand bucks to first place oh wow yeah Dude, well, you know it's like fifty dollars a person or something like that and then uh we did a um we had some gear donated to us and we did a yellow perch side pot. And the biggest oh, cool. perch was like 12 and a half inches. 
Do you po- do you host a lot of tournaments? Is that something that you're trying to get into? No, now? I tr- I did it this year because I wanted to see how it would go with a small group of people that I would trust not to pull some Ohio walleye crap. Mm-hmm. If you know what I'm saying. So, yeah. you know, people where I didn't, I didn't need a lie detector test from, you know, like people I knew because they, they're in the community. I, they are invite only. This tournament was an invite only. And that was an invite on your, based on your stature in the community and what you've done. And now we're trying to establish that every year. So it's like a goal. Like if you, you know, like your parents would reward you, if you were good at the house, you would get a treat. That's, you know, mm-hmm. the kind of thing is like, if you're good with the community and you treat the community with respect, you get invited to the tournament and that's how you get by, you know, there's a lot of people that were in that tournament that help out the community nonstop. And that's what I'm trying to get more involved with is people that want to help the community as opposed to keep it quiet, hush, hush to themselves for themselves. And you mentioned bow fishing. Is that a big problem down on the wrap? Yes, sir. It's a, uh, it's a nightly deal, man. If I'm out here long enough, I almost guarantee somebody's going to come shoot tonight. There's a boat really? ramp right. Yeah, there's a boat ramp right in front of me. I'm at a soft launch on a pier, which only allows a kayak or my fold-up boat, technically non-trailered vehicles. And then the, on the other side of the bridge, there's a boat ramp, and it's ten-dollar launch, open twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week. So they launch as soon as they launch, they're shooting because mm-hmm. this is a high, high snakehead area, kind of like uh, Quiet Creek. You know, this is this is our this is our Quiet Creek. If I had to if I had to say that from here to Wilmot. Yeah, and and we had uh, we had John Odenkirk on this show who actually runs that area, and he talked about how the Rappahannock right now is one of the premier destination for snakeheads right now. It's doing extremely well. Buddy, I can't explain to you how good this fishery is and how people try to come fish it the same way they fish other places, and that does not pay off because this is its own ecosystem here. We catch double digits down to 12 feet deep here. Oh, wow. Not I don't know anybody else that does that at any point anywhere else and we can do it religiously we can we can go out right now and i can go work all these channel edges and work deep water and find them there and then come up in the shallow and four feet of water and burn them here i was getting ready to start throwing buzz baits just to see if <laughs> i get a response while we were sitting here chatting because i know they're around me i know i i can tell you right now there's 40 snakehead in front of me easily easily 40 snakehead in front of me the the hydrilla is like two and a half feet thick and then you got another foot and a half of water on top of it. So they just lay down the hydrilla. You can't see them. Even if you come to bow fish them, all you're looking at is hydrilla. It, it's so crazy to me as a guy that grew up in Virginia, that, that got to fish in high school a little bit, got to travel, and you never heard about the Rappahannock at all. And when I was blessed when I started to do this and started to talk to individuals like you, and I didn't realize how much of a hidden gym the Rappahannock is. And, and, and I guess as a guy that hasn't been there and done a lot of fishing, why does it seem like to the general public, people don't know about the Rappahannock? Is it just because it's protected? I think, or it's, it- I think it's protected. So you have a lot of local people that are old school hush hush, like the old school crabbers, man, that, you know, the guys that run the pound nets at the mouth and, um, you know, the big hoop nets for catfish down at Carter's Creek or Carter's Wharf. Um, so you have a lot of people that try to keep it quiet. Woods and Water Magazine wouldn't do a, a monthly expose on it. If you notice in the back of Woods and Water, they always do a regional, James River, Potomac uh, River, Lake Anna, whatever, um, it, even Bay stuff. But they would never, they still won't do something for this river. This last um this last woods and waters they did one report about snakehead fish in the rappahannock river but it was a small one let me tell you what we can go up right now and catch 20 inch five pound smallie all the way up in fredericksburg we can come down to here right now and catch snakehead and catfish up to 100 pounds there's yellow perch all through here bluegill large mouth up to eight nine pounds out here um as we go down the catfish stop about Tappahannock, and then you start, as soon as you hit Urbana, it starts turning into saltwater fish, and you get your puppy drum, your speckled trout, your rockfish, even though your rockfish will come all the way up to Route 1 here, but your rockfish will stay down there, and you'll catch them all summer down there, flounder, sheepset, black sea bass, cobia, shark, ray, all that stuff's down that way, yeah, and, and people want to run to Virginia Beach to go get it, but if you know I like to tell people it's a when thing because it's all migratory species. You got to know when they're going to be here. Then you need to know where to go look for them. But if you don't know the when, then you'll, you'll never know the where. 
because mm-hmm. you, you have to know when they're in here first because everything that um, feeds and breeds, it does it in the bay on the East Coast. Anything that lives on the East Coast on the shoreline feeds and breeds in the bay. Tarpon, all that stuff in the bay. So Tarpon in the bay. Wow. Yeah. So late summer, we get them in over by Fisherman's Island, um, Eastern Shore. We've had great white shark peeing inside the bay. That, yeah, that no happened last December. Nuts. <laughs> yeah, dude. Dude, so we get, you know, we get like 10 foot bull sharks that roll up in here and go up in like St. Mary's County and Potomac oh. and all that stuff, right? I would like the not. Furthest yeah. up they've, the furthest up they've been recorded was in the early 1900s at the Tidal Basin. Dude, I would not be DC. shocked at all. I Dude, mean, I don't get in this water at all. If I can't see the bottom, I don't get in it. <laughs> I don't understand those people that do the, those like triathlons on the Potomac River. Like that is just, I would not do that at all. You couldn't pay me enough money. Dude, and it's not only that, but like the stingrays, the cow nose rays and Atlantic rays are ridiculous. And if you can't see the bottom and you don't walk right, you're going to get, you're going to get tagged in the thigh or the leg mm-hmm. or, or and the calf or the leg. So it's just, it's one of those things. Like if you can't see the bottom in it, then you got jellyfish galore. Then you have, uh, you know, algae blooms because the pesticide runoff. I got burnt here last year from pesticide runoff on my hand. From Literally from pesticide. pesticide. So, so if I show you, Go for it. you can look all around and everywhere you see a tree line, there's a field of some sort, soy, corn, wheat, whatever. So in the wintertime or in the fall, right before they harvest, they come out here and they pesticide. They come out here with planes and they'll mm. spray the fields. And I'll do all of them within like three to five days. Last year, it just happened to happen that when they did it, the next day it rained. Two days later, I was out here um, doing snakehead on a kayak. And I had gotten it. It was floating on the surface, looked like um, shards of fiberglass floating on the surface in, inside of silt. Wow. And I, have, I was grabbing a buddy's kayak and pulling him up because I had a trolling motor. So I was, I was towing him around. He didn't have a trolling motor. So I'd grab the little handle in the front, pull it up and let it go. And then, you know, unclip them and push them back. And it roached me inside my fingers inside here. And when I got home, I thought it was poison oak. I was like, oh man, it's going to be itching. I woke up in the morning burning with big, huge blisters. And I was like, what the heck? And I started looking up chemical burn. And it was a chemical burn, like a lie burn, like from freaking Fight Club. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? And come to find out it's agricultural runoff. And when they sprayed the field, went through the soil and came out to the water. So that's diluted. Mm. What happens if it, you're up there when they spray it on the field? How bad is it up there? So That is something interesting that I didn't yeah, know was happening on the Rappahannock. Yeah, and well, it's not only like that, but it's all around here because they, they also changed the the um, pesticide like five years ago because the bird life was almost gone. It, it drove out all the ospreys, all the bald eagles, all that stuff, and they've changed about five years ago. Now they're all back. But now we're getting red tides because of it. That's where the uh-huh. red tides are coming from. How has the grass been? Because you said like there's a good amount of hydrilla, coontail, things like that. So the grass beds are still intact? Yeah. So I'm looking down right now, and I can tell you I've got hydrilla. It's here, but it's starting to break off. The grass down bay is already broken off. It looks like burnt cra- um, burnt patches. But the hydrilla up here is still holding pretty good. Um, this year it didn't get super bad That's because good. we had – a cooler spring. If we get a hot spring, shoot, buddy, this stuff's going to pop up and it's going to be up fast and you won't be able to fish inside the grass. You won't be able to run a trolling motor through it. You won't be able to do nothing. It'll mm-hmm. be so thick. But this year it wasn't so bad and it it creates great structure and cover for everything around here. <clears throat> oh, and here, the snakehead hunt in packs. Really? I'm telling you, dude, it's a whole different ball game out here. You can get them probably the traditional way, topwater frogs and all that. But when I come out here, I work inside the water column for them. I rarely ever come up top anymore because, dude, I hate missing on frogs. I'm sorry. I freaking hate missing on frogs because you don't know if you should count one, two, 25, 90, whatever. So when they bite it, you don't know when to set the hook. So it's like I'd rather work the water column for them and catch the bigger ones that I think the bow fishermen scare off the flats into the deeper ditch. So when they come out here and they shoot, and they're like, you know, they shoot. 50 in a night and then i come out the next morning i'm just trying to get like five or six i won't touch the grass if i see any um mud motor marks inside the grass fresh mud motor marks mm. which you can see on your fish finder um but if, if i see that i won't fish on the grass i'll go right to the channel edge and start working like flukes and under uh weedless underspoon jigs and stuff like that on the channel edge and burn them up dude 
how long has the bow fishing been an issue and, and are they regulated the same way as anglers or are they regulated at all? How does all that work? So if they are regulated, they're not regulated on the water because um, there's no governing body out here unless it's a special deal. So like you come out here at midnight and shoot whatever the hell you want. Nobody sees you. So we got guys that I know of that have shot largemouth just to shoot largemouth shot game fish just to shoot game fish just to shoot them but then there's some guys that won't let you shoot anything under 20 inches and whatever you shoot you got to take home mm-hmm. so i respect those guys you know and they'll take out i've got a buddy who takes out amish people you know and they throw a spear with a freaking rope attached to it <laughs> holy shit <laughs> yeah so i definitely respect that dude if you can hit a fish and get that get him back more more power to you no, that I is can. impressive that wow. is throwing a spear is definitely impressive <laughs> That that's I would like to see that personally. Now I'm not a in the military. I used to call for fire, which means I would be able to see really far and call fire missions on far targets. So shooting something six ten feet in front of me does not seem appealing. It doesn't seem like a challenge. I mean, you know, I think I know a- it is. I see it is. I understand there's a skill set to it, but I just don't. Uh, you're you're spotlighting fish, in my opinion. And I think the biggest issue here, and there's always a fun little debate about this, is about where is the position of the snakehead in the ecosystem. And for people that, you know, you've listened to the show and everything, I still foresee in about 10 years that snakehead will probably be protected because the snakehead cult is growing every day. It is, but we have a big, we have a big issue with the, and the issue is, is they're labeled invasive through the federal government Mm -hmm. until that label changes. You can't do anything with them. You can't turn them to a non-native game fish. You can't, until that, la- until somebody in Congress can change that label, nothing will ever change. And the reason why they did that is because you cannot import invasive species. And that's how they block the importation of them. But since they're already here, it doesn't matter. And people have been stocking them everywhere because they want to catch them. So do you, do you think in like five to 10 years, things will change? The, the, the opinion of them will change? <sighs> Probably not because the smear campaign of, it walks on land and eats babies and will will eat your Yorkie, you know, is still running around and people still believe that, which is sad because that's mm-hmm. not exactly how they are. <laughs> They're a skittish fish that swallow everything whole that have teeth that breathe air. That's, that's about it. Real good ambush predators and got some speed on them and real good um, agility. I think the smartest fish I've ever fished for personally. It's, it's very, it's, it's really weird because I think the opinion has shifted a little bit since they first got in there to where people thought it was going to eat their dog and their little kids. And all of a sudden, you you know, you have people that all they do is fish for snakeheads and they have the name, the dragon, look at the hashtags and stuff. So I'm hoping in 10 years, things do change because people realize they can make money off of having like a snakehead stamp. Um, oh, and they're doing it now. Like Wegman's Wegman sells at nineteen dollars a pound in really? the grocery store right now. Yeah, man, uh, we've got uh, thirty dollar plate dinners up by the wharf in DC with snakehead mm-hmm. on. It's a delicacy around here. When you oh, yeah, cut no. it open, it don't look like fish. It looks like chicken breast. Mm-hmm. No, they're, they're they're like the best eating fish, and, and that's why I hope you know maybe what will happen is they'll do like they do a trout stamp. They're going to do a snakehead stamp because if they get rid of this fishery, they're going to lose all the money. Because that also leads into the thing that that'll also help with the bow hunting if it becomes kind of a fish that can't just be killed completely. Yeah, but you can say all that, but they have to follow the law. That's the issue because there's nobody out here governing them. That's at true. any point in time on a Friday and Saturday night, if you come over here at nine o'clock at night, you're going to see a minimum of four people shooting right here in the main stem which doesn't include what's up in the creeks. There's probably going to be eight or 10 trailers in the parking lot over there. And they're all going to be shooting and they're all going to get 30 fish. If not more, there's been nights where I've seen them shoot 150. Is this a Rappahannock problem? Is this a Rappahannock problem? I'm sorry. Is this a Rappahannock problem or just all fish? It is because the the level of pressure is way less than, than the Potomac. I got So you have a lot of guys that live out in King, Mary County, uh, Richmond County, that don't want to go up and shoot on the Potomac. So they'll come over here and shoot on the, the wrap. And you can also go Piscataway Creek, Pat Point Creek and get them. I mean, there's a bunch of places that you, they get them down in Deltaville now in the saltwater mm-hmm. because you know, they don't, they breathe air, dude. They don't, they don't filter shit. Yeah. So they don't give a shit unless it's hundred percent salt. And then dude, they're catching them down in Deltaville, like in the mm-hmm. freaking Creek in Sturgeon Creek in the back. That's where it's crazy. like really salty. <laughs> Yeah, um, by Reedville 
over by the Omega plant. They're catching them off a of shell landing right there, too, and, and up um, the Great Wicomico by Glebe Point, too. So, the, I mean, they're all through there. They get them in crab pots and, and all that stuff out there, too. Dude, that is really crazy. Yeah. I'm telling no, that, you, man, that's a bad fish. No, and I, I, it's never, it's not going anywhere. They're never going to eradicate no. it. It's here to stay. It's just how our culture about them changes. It, it, it is, and we also think another thing might be happening is there might be a hybridization between bowfin and snakehead. What the hell does that make? <laughs> I hope a, a, a kick-ass apex predator that's uh, protected game fish since it would be a, a native fish. <laughs> that is true. That is true. It would be, it would be native. <laughs> We've caught some, man, that we thought that had the, the, the mouth and jaw structure of a bowfin, but had the scale and pattern of a snakehead. Oh, that's freaking cool looking. Yeah. Dude, so, that is I nuts. mean, and if it does, I'd be I'd love to see that. Because Bofin can get up to like 40 pounds. Yeah, like that would be that would be really, really cool. But I also I just really hope that the Rappahannock stays like one, at the premier, I would say it's like the premier snakehead fishery. And, and I really hope that things change somehow, some way to keep it that way. It it, it would be nice. Um it's really the bow fishing pressure that's got to it. Even if they had a season, like say if bow fishing had it, because they're out, mining, you, they're out gigging and shooting in January. I've seen photos from Lake Anna up by um, Hunting Run Reservoir or Hunting Run where you um, launch at, or Christopher Run, sorry, and uh, they, in January, and they're pale white, and they're like 10 pounds, and they're up in like three feet of water. Mm. But you can tell it's cold. You can see the dude's breath on the pictures and all that, and it, it's, so there's, there's no relief of that type of pressure ever because they do it all year long mm. you know and i stopped fishing for snakehead as soon as water just temp hits 55 degrees really i won't mess with them until after until until it comes back up to 55 is it because they go dormant they're just <laughs> not gonna be, there's other yeah, things the bite catch. gets harder and then you're fighting off catfish um because they'll hit lures just as hard as snakehead and you don't know if it's a catfish or a snakehead until about three seconds into the fight but you'll get a lot of like other stuff hitting when you're trying to target snakehead in that type of water temperature in my opinion and then i think they come out on like hot sunny late days and stuff like that so you could probably get them on a 55 degree day when the water temps 48 or something like that but if you go up on the sunny flat and it's 55 then they'll be right there yeah plus uh -huh. you get into catfishing season too when i know like you guys have blues a little bit of flats like that's when yeah. that really heats up too yeah, like right now, from now until freaking February is going to be the biggest cat time that you'll you'll see. You'll catch the biggest ones. The biggest one we've seen out here is 111. Do you think the Rappahannock could break the state record for blue? No, because we don't have the water flow and depth. I think the James is going to crush it, and you can't you can't beat Kerr with the depth and no water flow. So they don't. So depth. water flow equals to me equals movement. Movement equals to burnt calories equals to feeding. So if you get into a lake that has no water flow or movement, they feed, 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 and don't burn calories. So they just stack weight. Ah, uh, so okay. Why, yeah, so it's like same person, huh. same thing as like us, like eating a bunch of fast food and not working out. Yeah. We're going to gain weight. Same thing with them is, is if they're not moving around and burning calories to chase food, they're just going to keep stacking pounds. I didn't even think of that. That's really interesting. Huh. <laughs> Flow dynamics, man. Flow dynamics. Yeah, no, that, that, that does make sense. Um, Because, yeah, I know the James pumps out some insane ones, but I feel it like does, the James consistent. gets more pressure. Yeah, they're consistent, but it's a lot more pressure. But that is a internationally known trophy blue cat fishery. There's guys that are flying from Okinawa, from Thailand, mm -hmm. to come over here and fish for blue catfish on that river because of how consistent that river is. Well, and you literally just said it, but and that's also why I think the rap will become internationally known for snakehead too, if it's not already. Like, I mean, but I think there's other species there as well. But that's kind of where I see the rap right now as an outsider that doesn't have your experience, um, and that's why it's a shame that I really wish that resource would be protected. You know, it is, but it, it, you also got to think this with this way too. It's also premier bow fishing destination, so it's yeah. like, you know, until we can find. Peace. <laughs> Peace Harmony. between the two groups. Okay, I don't know if you saw this, but did you see the guys shooting snakehead midday in Maryland? No, I did not. Oh, man. There's a video of a gentleman on a kayak working a snakehead, stand up, working a frog. Two guys on a bow boat. Midday, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, go right over in front of him. Shoot the snakehead right in front of him that he's been working the whole time. And then just turn off and raise their arms like, oh, sorry. Mm. Buddy. 
I don't think that'll happen in Virginia because of uh, too many weapons. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's that's some brazen that's some brazen stuff to do to somebody. Mm-hmm. You know that that's kind of. But that also shows you some of their mentality in my eyes. I think there are a lot of opportunistic people. You know the the bow fishermen because it's 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 such an easy thing to shoot right in front of you. You can go out and get thirty in a night. You can shoot a bunch of catfish real easy. Two hours and you got thirty fish on the boat and it ain't nothing. You know, it's but it's opportunistic. I think it's just you know easy. That's something and, we need to cover more on this show is the bow the bow hunting issues and, and that culture too. You know, we so slowly started to talk about the catfishing. Tried to have a balanced approach. Talk to the DNR. Talk to avid anglers on both sides and then yeah just to understand like what's going on with this bow hunting thing because it seems like the more i peel back the layers the more of a the more friction there actually is let's say that between the there different is spots. and and i've had i think it's the both it's either the virginia bow fishing association or the american bow fishing association one of their members or um leaders or something had reached out to me and we had had a discussion back and forth because of them going out and shooting and dumping everything at the boat ramp or leaving it out in the river and not slitting it so it's floating on the surface with holes all in it. We understand some fish are going to get away. We understand some fish are going to die. Same thing with catch and release on us. Same thing. Some fish are going to die. Some fish are going to live. The thing is, when you come back to the boat ramp and there's 60 fish dead and there's so many buzzards you can't access the dumpster for the restaurant, there's an issue. And then you're going, that's wasteful because... There's crabbers that could use that for pots. There's people that could eat that meat, literally just take that home and eat it because it's such a good meat. So we were talking about doing solar-powered refrigerators at um, drop spots. So when you come off the freaking thing, you just throw it in the freezer and just put up a post saying, hey, it's there or whatever, however that they want to get it out there. And then somebody can go pick it up or somebody else can go pick it up. But we also think a lot of them are selling them. And I don't know how that law works because you're bow fishing a, an invasive species. <laughs> blue catfish are non-native not evasive anymore so I, I don't understand how what laws pertain to them selling them what they would need license wise to sell a fish after that it's is, been yeah. bow fished that is interesting when you bring up the blue cat situation because I've talked and people are split on this too I talked to David Dave Sikorsky who runs the uh, Chesapeake Bay Association and he thinks like the snakehead is not a problem at all of the fisheries he's more worried about the blue cats because of how Number prolific one. they are yep and Number one. It, it's so crazy because they don't talk about this like if you didn't know any better you would not understand the whole dynamic of like i heard it explained to me like like blue cats are kind of like the pig bomb in texas where they just they breed and they just, grow yep, and blew up and blew yeah. up and blew up and blew up so far out of control that now they're trying to bring them back and they can't you know I mean, they did a trawl a 500 yard trawl with a net on the bay side of whitestone bridge for catfish and got five thousand pounds holy crap one draw now none of them were over 15 pounds because of how the salt density the bigger ones don't like the salt density but yeah. they were all out there that's that's insane that's, wow it, it, i can i can i can wholeheartedly tell you the blue catfish is the number one issue on this river um as your competition for food how has that affected the pilchers and the migratory herring and things like that so our herring, I have a big issue with that too, is because this is the Rappahannock is one of the most protected um, spawning areas for herring, hickory shad, striped bass. Huh. So from this bridge up, you haven't been able to keep a striped bass over 28 inches for like 10 years, because you can go up um, in Old Mill Park right next to, to Route One in the rapids and catch them on shad gear, 50 inches. Big stripers. That's so weird. Because so they're up weird. there and they're, they're there to spawn out and come back out and they're eating all small stuff because they're full of roe and semen. So people will catch them on flies and shad gear and darts and all that crazy stuff. Um, but it's been protected. So like we do all the, my, my issue is we do all this conservation, right? For the herring, we can't use not one of them. They go out the coast and go up the, the coast to Newfoundland right above Maine. And mm -hmm. they get to net them out by the millions of pounds after we've done all the conservation. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I don't think is fair, but. I mean, I can tell a congressman it ain't going to go far. <laughs> no, but you're right. The, the thing has to be done about that. I, I think it, it was Mr. Sikorsky that posted an article about that, about how you have this international group going out there and netting all the stuff that we're trying to protect. And Yeah, like, that's, that's the Omega company. That's the yeah, bunker. 
how the hell is that a thing? Like, why are we so, letting that happen? So they were originally in, in, I believe, in three locations, if I'm correct. One in New York, New Jersey, here, and one in Louisiana. Three years ago, they kicked him out of New York and New Jersey. Two years ago, you can catch bluefin tuna looking at the Statue of Liberty because of it. It had brought the bait back so thick and so big, the tuna followed it right in. Or that is flushings or whatever, and catching them on poppers on the edge, in, in the in the in the city, because it, so cool. it had moved in there. Um, out of Louisiana, they kicked him out of Louisiana two years ago. So mm. now all the vessels are here in Virginia, and for some dumb reason, they've allowed them to fish inside the bay and inside the wrap up to Whitestone Bridge. I literally went out of Wake Boat Ramp on the bay side of Whitestone Bridge one Sunday. Caught fish, posted up that I'd caught fish, said there was a bunch of bait. Monday, they were right in front of the island I was fishing, netting the bait. So I know they've used my information to go out and get bait. I know they have. You just have to wonder, like, whose pocket's getting lined? Where's the money going that these things are allowed to happen? That was the big thing because originally Congress held their quota. Congress gave them their quota three or four years ago. These guys were brazen enough to write a letter back to Congress and say, no, we're going to take what we want. And Congress was like, oh, no problem. They kicked it down to VMRC. VMRC did the first thing they did was cut it by two thirds. Gave them, I think it was like one third of the quota the first year. Oh, come and said, on. said, if you step out of line, we're going to kick you out. And then next year, they didn't step out of line. So next year, they gave them a little more. I think they're setting them a trap. I think they're setting them a trap to get them out of here. So that's my opinion. I hope it happens because the Menhaden fishery itself is not a bad deal. It's the industrial size of the Menhaden fishery out there that's the issue. And the reason why is you've got a huge boat that has two, like 25, 26 foot boats on it with nets attached to it that go out and the nets are 30 feet deep that go out and grab the whole school. But then they grab all the trophy fish underneath of it that are eating the bait. So when, and they boast there are no bycatch fishery, so everything that's not a bunker gets rail dumped dead. So you've got a five mile line of sludge with dead cobia and drum, all trophy fish, all floating through it. Mm. My issue is with the size of the of the fishery. If you were to downscale it and use shorter nets to grab um, the top closer to the surface and not grab as far down, it I'd be more productive in that we wouldn't kill the trophy fishery here, but then not affect the whole fishery on the East Coast because of it. They mm -hmm. don't understand, like, the trickle-down effect is you just killed 14,000 pounds of trophy fish. They have it on record. They're getting questioned for it as we speak now um, within the last couple of months. Out of those 14,000 fish that will never breed again, how much did you just hurt the, that, that whole species on the whole coast? Because those fish come from Florida, deep water, and run up here to spawn out and go back down there. So the whole, all of them fish are now gone. So they're not going to spawn out. They're not going to have a million babies, you know. So not all that's gone. And that that was the same thing with the striped bass fishery because they're taking the bunker out. Yeah, it's so crazy <laughs> to think about how like every little thing affects this bay and like how we can get it back. And it's, it's one it's, step. It's, it's scary. It's literally one step to make this whole place bounce right back. And all you have to do is kick out the omega and tell them to go out to the three-mile island or three-mile line off the coast and go fish out there every single time you want. You are not allowed in the bay, and you are not allowed in the river. That's how I think it should be. We're the only idiots that ever allowed them in a bay. I don't know. You know, money. Money, greed all probably, you know, was the, was the motivation behind all that. Yeah, and, and the sad thing is with anything that happens, it takes a tragedy or something like that for anything to be, like, changed. And, and guys, again, you know, if you're listening to this show, you know, email your congressperson, you know, email the governor of Virginia, and, and yep. hopefully we can maybe rattle some cages to try to get something moving here. Also, I mean, you, can, you can link up with Chesapeake Bay Defenders. That's Chesapeake a group, Bay Defenders? Yeah, that's a group through Facebook that you can get on with that um, monitors. So they monitor the boats when they go out. They've got six spotter planes that go out. Just to show you what the level of how much money they're making, six planes, six big vessels with two boats in each of those vessels, plus nets, plus a factory. So wow. they're making a, a lot of money off of this stuff. So it's kind of hard to shut that down when they're when 
the squeaky wheel is getting the grease. So it, I just think that if you move them out to the ocean and you give it five years, I don't, you could even do this intermittent fishing, two years fishing, one year, no fishing, two years or vice versa, just to see if it'll bounce back as a test. You know, who's going to hurt? It's not going to hurt us. Mm -hmm. the, the, they're taking our resource and giving it to Canada. It's not hurting us. All we're getting is a little bit of a kickback. You know, make them suffer a little bit for the the problems that they're causing. I don't think they're I don't think they're being held accountable as much as they should be. You're not wrong. You know, you're not, you're not wrong at all. And, and and little changes can lead to big successes if we actually do something like that about it. I mean, it's gotten to the point where people are threatening to go out there and drill holes in a boat and do all that other shit. And you know, it's it's getting bad because you got a lot of these charter captains that were relying on trophy striped back bass fishing for money to live they can't do that anymore not unless you do catch and release and you set up with a taxidermist to do a mount or else it's not worth it because you can't take the fish home a mm -hmm. lot of people still want to take a big fish home but it's better if you just release them you know and just put them back and go and get you a mount take five pictures and four measurements and you can get the exact mount that you want and then the fish gets to live and you should feel a lot happier but a lot of people like to go cro magnum and catch fish and eat them because that's what makes them feel like they're, you know, in touch with nature, I guess. Speaking about the, like the trophy sized fish, what what is so the large amount population in Rappahannock is interesting because because for people that don't know, there was a private group that actually did a stocking program to, to kind of like, I guess, prove in a way to the DNR that, hey, this actually might be plausible as in a way to, to supplement the, the yes. genes and the population. And that happened at the Rappahannock, right? Yes, sir. It happened on the, it happened on the dock right over at the, um, the restaurant. And me and my old lady were catfishing the same day they came down and dropped them in the water. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> it, was just, it was just a happenstance thing, and they put them in there. And um, I know a local place had gotten like 45,000 F1 largemouth bass fingerlings. But then I think somebody matched them or DNR matched them or DJF matched them. And I, I, I want to say it was 105,000 F1 large ma mouth bass fingerlings that were dropped in the river. And I asked the guy, I said, how much do they cost? And he said, 95 cents each. And then I said, wow. oh, wow. And I said, what's the mortality rate? He said, 30%. I said, so you only expect 30% to live out of all that? So you just wasted $70,000? He goes, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but it, they're here. I can tell you right now, I've caught my biggest bass in the river was this year, and it was right over there. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. That's awesome. And guess what it hit? An artificial bass. <laughs> <laughs> the old baby bass fluke, man. <laughs> no, that can't beat that. So, so is the largemouth bass population doing well there then still? Yes. Um, uh, was it Fredericksburg Fishing Club just had their, turn, their um, championship or whatever this past weekend? And, you know, they're averaging 16-pound bags, 14-pound bags. Decent bags. I mean, that's a, that's a good five-fish bag for a river with a lot of pressure on it. But, I mean, it does. The, the, the largemouth fishery is not hurting on this river by far. And I, if anybody tells you the snakehead are crushing them, that's a dead-ass lie. Because I can vouch for that right now because I caught more largemouth than I did snakehead last year. Mm-hmm. And they were getting in my way and they were getting feisty and they wanted to tear up shit. We literally got a wall down here. We just call it largemouth wall because you, you can barely get a snakehead off it because the largemouth weren't so hard. Really? Yeah. That one all the way down in the back. It's a flat wall. Uh, the, the river goes around to the left. Yep. Dude, that's freaking awesome. Yeah. Oh, buddy, if you came out here, me and you could spend a day out here and have a blast. It's so crazy because, like, it's just I, no one talks about the rap, and it's almost an injustice because it's. I keep hearing these rumors of how good it is for so many things, and I, I think in some circles, like for snakehead, of course, everybody thinks it's revered. It's like the number one fishery, but for bass, for catfish, for everything, and it's like right near Fredericksburg, right down ninety five, and I don't think anyone gives it its, its due. I, you know, and I didn't see that either, and that was another reason why I did the group and. Man, let me tell you the flack I got for telling people where to catch fish. I have, mm -hmm. I literally just had a discussion about speckled trout. Um, a guy from another group that I posted in his group about catching speckled trout messaged me and asked me, hey, buddy, um, I'm getting a lot of people complaining about giving away the spot. And all I said was the river. 
I just said the river. I didn't even say location. I just, the river's 15 miles long and it's got two branches. So it's like, you know, and then I, it's just a lot of these people, I find that snakehead purists, speckled trout purists, largemouth purists are some of the worst selfish people out there fishing right now. In my personal opinion. Now that's just my opinion. It could be dead ass wrong, but it's my opinion. It's just because of what I've dealt with. And they think that you're going to go and you're going to give away the secret that's going to stop them from going and getting their fish that they need for a tournament or for whatever personal reason that they need to catch or whatever it is. And it's, that's not the issue. Speckled trout, especially, they're migratory. I mean, sweet Jesus, we've, we've been hammering them. I got another trip Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and next Saturday. All out for speckled trout and drum. For the our, drum our, run out and, uh, and rockfish. Oh, sorry, sir. Uh, so are, are, are speckled trout and, and baby drum, like when I grew up, like it was just striper, maybe a bluefish every now and then. But now you start to see the Instagram and Facebook posts and there's more baby drum, there's more trout, which is exciting. I think that's cool as hell. Like, like yes. when when did that start becoming a thing? Because that is going to be awesome for local guides and charter captains to have that exactly. available. Exactly. All the inshore guides that aren't a single species oriented and can do multiple species those guys are going to ring in left and right, man, because you can keep five speckled trout at 14 inches. You can keep three puppy drum in slide at 18 to 26 inch slot. You can keep one rockfish a person. That is literally nine fish you can take home in one day per person on a inshore trip. That's so cool. And you and every single one of them, they all ride together. So wherever you catch a drum, you can catch a speck, you can catch a rock at. Because they mm. all hunt the same locations up here in the brackish water. I have a tendency to not listen to anybody else on tips, tactics, and all that stuff because this is brackish away from the ocean. We're 60 miles away from the ocean. So whatever, like, no offense to Salt Strong, they've got good information. Whatever works for them inshore does not work here inshore, brackish. You have to learn how to adapt freshwater and saltwater tactics together, and that'll give you the best result. Match bait fish, match the hatch, ledges, edges, and points because they're all ambush predators. So then it, going into like late October, November, is that when the trout and the redfish start running or are they more of a summertime deal? The drum are more of a summertime deal. Like they'll run in, black drum will come in first, the red drum will come in second, Kobe will come in, um, and this would be all after the striper run, the tail end of the striper run. Very rarely are you ever lucky, and it has happened, where you can catch a trophy drum, a trophy rock, and a trophy cobia all on the same trip. Dude, that would be a grand slam. <laughs> Two dudes got it last year, and I was jealous. I was really jealous. But I, I, that's a hard that's a hard feat because it's a timing thing of the migratory. If if you get the, the temperatures off, then they're missing each other. It's a big water temp deal thing here because that's what draws them in is the water temp and the food source that comes in the bay. And then if Omega snatches up the food source, they don't come in. So then you get piss poor stock assessments. Mm. People don't think of that one. <laughs> you know, no. like Maryland does their, their, their uh, striped bass stock assessment. And it's wrong because Omega takes all the bunker out. The striper follows in. So the striper stays off the coast of, of Virginia Beach and circles around out there and doesn't come in the bay. And they spawn out out there. So their babies die faster and get eaten out there. And then you don't get stripers running up the bay. So you get a, a, an assessment that says, oh, they're not here. That means that we took them all out. And that's not the case they're off the coast so then you get a false stock assessment which means you get a false regulation adjustment dude no you were you were just dropping the information bombs like this is <laughs> stuff that i had no idea about this is a, this is really really good stuff um and again guys uh links to everything in the episode description so you can you can check out all of his social media including both of his fishing reports um do you do any would you take people out guiding uh, is that something that you'd be interested in for people that are watching yes um i've I do guide in Lake Anna. Um, I can do kayak stuff out here, um, and I can instruct on on other people's boats. But I do not charter. I do not take people out for my on my boat for money. I don't do that. But I will hop on somebody else's boat and and instruct them how to fish and how to use their own. There's a lot of people out here in the bay um, that are more prideful because they got their own vessel. So they don't want to pay for a charter to go out because they got their own vessel. And sometimes it's just, you know, they're putting in the time and effort. And it's just not clicking in. And they might have too much peripheral stuff, you know, kids, house, work, all that stuff, you know, so they can't focus. I kind of help them refocus on fishing, um, put them back into the hunt mode where they want to hunt something down. I love seeing when somebody gets that little glimmer of where they want to go hunt a fish down. They want to track a fish down. 
like because it makes me feel like they you know they're learning and they want to do they want to be better at what they're doing so all i do is i teach them how to use their vessel better just so that they can do it if they don't have a trolling motor teach them how to cut it off and drift how to not anchor how to come in quietly so you can catch more fish with a two stroke you know stuff like that people just you know it's just the little small things the little micro adjustments that can turn into triple digit days you know and 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 it's just a lot of people that are prideful out that way that don't want to pay for the charter. They'd rather just have somebody come on their boat, hang out with them all day. I sell them rigs and jigs, and then I give them instruction for free. No, well, that's what how is, I work it. What is one thing that you would want the public to know about the Rappahannock River? You're missing out. First and foremost, you're missing out. If you don't think it's here and you don't think you can catch anything here, man, shoo. You can bring your family out. We have the shad run. If you want to get somebody hooked on fishing, bring them out to the shad run. They catch 50 fish in a day and can't lift a Coke bottle at the end of the day. You know, really? it's, it's a blast. You know, that's how you get a lot of people hooked on it is by taking them shad fishing or crappy fishing or whatever, you know, whatever temperatures they can stand. And a lot of people are fair weather fishermen. They don't want to go out in the wintertime, which you have to here if you want to keep fishing. You can't just go dormant over the wintertime. You just got to hop species. Like now I'll be on... So I'll still do snakehead until probably middle of November. Speckled trout, drum, rockfish until season closes. Um, rockfish definitely until season closes. But speckled trout and drum until probably mid-November. 50, 55 degree water temp ish, whatever. And then I'll start working on crappy and uh, shifting over to the lake for walleye. And then going to the mountains for smallie and musky. I should be at for smallie and musky at the end of the month. So when you say mountains are small and musky, like what mountains? You, where, where are you talking about in general? Um, near Grottoes, uh, north and south river, where it turns into the South Shenandoah Fork. Um, oh, okay. It's literally the last highest place up the mountain that they stock musky. And I was there last year or earlier this year and foul hooked one and caught a shit ton of smallies there. Hmm. Yeah, but it's I can't wait to go. I, I want to get a musky on my own. <coughs> and I think we can do it. No, we take the fold-up boat. The fold-up boat <laughs> goes down through the rapids, bro. We literally stand up. So we wear waders. We took the trolling motor last time and broke the prop pin on one of the rapids. So we're like, we're not even going to bring the trolling motor next time. And if we do, we're not going to run through the rapids. So <laughs> we got stuck on the rapids three times. And my buddy had to hop out and, and spin us off of them in, in like 50-degree water. Mm. But it was, it, was, it was really it was fun because we'd never done it. And we literally it, – it only flows one way. So once you mm -hmm. start, you go for 10 miles and you don't stop. And you can't go back up. So you have to get somebody to pick you up and then run you back down to get the vehicle so you can load all everything back up in the vehicle. So, it's you know, it's a feat, but it's cool because you access fish that are different. Mark, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I know we've covered guys, we cover a lot of topics here, a wide yes. gamut. Um, but is, is there, is there anything else that you'd like to promote any sponsors, anything else that, that, that you would like to talk about here? Um, support your local tackle shop, you know, catfish Kelly's, um, in Fredericksburg, RW's in Calio, JW's down in Deltaville, Grafton, um, down in, um, by York. Uh, there's a couple of them popping up. I think there's Shooter's Archery now out in Bumpus or, or out that way towards the lake, Lake Anna, High Point, um, and Anna Point Marina. Um, all these people are great people that will take care of you um, and steer you in the right direction to get on fish um, and give you the right information. Um, I just want to support them a little bit more than supporting big box companies. Yeah, especially guys when you're going into like, I mean, I guess, it, can we officially call it a recession? It's a recession. So as things get worse here, it's going to really hurt those mom and pop shops more than anybody else. So by supporting them, you're really not only, you're helping them survive, basically. So please, please do that if you have the money to do it. Exactly. You're definitely helping them um, survive. And not only that, but grow. We've been helping build Catfish Kelly's for the last three years and help them build up their um, stock and all that stuff. Uh, with you know recommendations from all the fishermen and they listened to that and got all that stuff in so it's nice to have a custom tailored fishing store to your location yeah and, and talk about catfish kelly's uh what are they just catfishing no so catfish kelly's country store is a um they sell like crabs they do breakfasts like in the winter time they open up at six so you can call them at six and say hey i'm coming i need four dozen minnows 
and two breakfast sandwiches. And by the time you get there, it's ready to go, so you can hurry up and get out on the water. Yeah, you, you can't beat that. You can't beat that. And then they got crabs all summer long. They've got tackle, blood worms. They carry eels, minnows. Um, and whatever we, we recommend, they usually get because it's what works around here. So I try to work with them a lot to help build them up. Um, I was not a big fan of gander at all because they kept lying to us over and over and over. And I'm, I'm really happy they're gone now. Are, are eels? I, I saw the, uh, I guess his name is Chunky Catfish, but he did live streams on TikTok and he kept fishing with live eels. Are, are they, are they really catfish candy? They are, but so are bluegill and so are mudshad. You know, if you put anything live out like that, but um, they're rockfish candy and they're cobia candy. Everything eats eels because they're small and they can fit them in their bellies when they're trying to spawn uh, when they're full of roe or semen. So it doesn't take up as much space inside the belly to make them feel as much pressure. Ah, that actually makes a lot of sense, yep. actually. Yep. Yeah, I knew for the Kobe, I think that was it. But yeah, that that's really cool. Mark, yeah. again, guys, please follow him. Follow both his fishing reports. And again, everything will be linked in the episode description so you can check him out. If you live in the area, you want him to help you figure out where to go to fish or just help you run your boat, he's more than willing to do that as well. And again, guys, please yep. leave us a like, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.